sends energy uh, from our machine into the brain. Uh, what it's doing when you uh, when we transmit that energy from the machine to the brain is it is stimulating the brain and causing what we call an action potential in the brain to conduct electricity. Um, I think if you press play, maybe it should go. I think play doesn't play. There you go. All right, perfect. We'll go to the next one. So, um, when looking at depression, I think one of the learning skills that, um, if you push the arrow to the right, I think it does. You bet. Um, one of the biggest lessons I had in medicine was I was, I was actually going to be an ICU doctor. That's, if you want to study brains, that's the place to do it, is watch them when they're traumatized. It's a very intense um, and very challenging team to be a part of, but you have to work together in order to get good outcomes. I loved that concept. I think the ICU and how they work as a team is one of my favorite places in medicine still to study and watch. But I had a baby and said, okay, <laughs> I might... I uh, love my job, but I'm not going to have time for a family as much as I wanted, so I went to outpatient medicine. And I was living in Utah, and what I didn't know as I transferred to the outpatient you know, clinic doctor was that Utah was the number one female depressed market in the country. And that I have all kinds of theories as to why that is, but uh, for, for female populations, it's the most depressed market in the country. And I swear they all found me the first four months of practice. <laughs> like every patient I would see, I'm like, there's really nothing wrong here that's organic. It's a, this is a brain problem. And I would, you know, so I, I became, there was vitals that were done as you check in, your height, your weight, and a screening for depression. I started like the fourth week I was there going, holy Hannah, if I don't figure out depression, I'm going to go back and take care of the intubated patients because they're all depressed out here. And what I learned was that was I wasn't far off. Um, not only was the depression really high in the area I was treating, but it was a time where um, there was quite a flare in the depression numbers in Utah and in the country. So I've learned that uh, screening for depression is one of the national initiatives that we screen every patient for depression by seeing how they're doing. And it's because we've learned the longer that brain goes in a depressive state, the more asleep, and that's a term I use to teach this uh, concept with, but the more asleep that brain becomes. That we have literature out there that says after 12 weeks of being in a depressed state, the chances that I'm gonna wake that brain back up to a normal functional state to where it was initially becomes almost zero. And that is so unfair. They don't even tell, they don't even tell their spouse they're depressed at 12 weeks, let alone get all the way to their doctor. So as these studies had gone on, the longer those brains spent in depression, the harder they were to actually completely awaken and continue uh, the what we call neural repair needed to get off the medications for depression, to get off the depression med medications that are used for, they can label anxiety, but a similar process happens to the brain with anxiety. Um, let alone if you have any brain trauma. Uh, I would have lots of my colleagues send me the neuropsychiatric patients, or they would have head traumas, and they'd send them to an outpatient doctor they knew really well, so I got a ton of head traumas. Um, my kids will never play football <laughs> if I have anything to say about it. <laughs> but they also will always wear a seatbelt uh, because the, most of the trauma patients that were coming had serious head injuries. And then that part of their brain never really woke up as well again as it should. And it caused unbelievable marked treatment-resistant depression. And this was, again, kind of a fluke of how I got such a large population of them in my early practice, but it's why I got really good at how do we check anything in their body that we can to make sure the brain has the power to repair. Um, these are things like make sure they're not anemic, make sure their B12 is normal, make sure that they don't have thyroid problems, make sure they don't have sleep apnea, and then make sure that if you have to help them remember how to sleep well again, you use the tools that actually improve their sleep hygiene and their sleep architecture. And then if you're not getting good outcomes that you don't wait, you don't put them on an antidepressant for six months 
before you do something else, before you add something else, before you improve it. You have a short window of time to repair and increase that outcome, and it's not as forgiving as we wish it were if when you don't do that. So this slide goes through uh, one of the World Health Organization outcomes is that if you look at the most uh, disability associated uh, time off work, um, uh, this, this accounts for not only missed work, but missed productivity. Depression wins every time. Meaning what happens when we take our culture and we say, you get rewarded in our culture for having a good brain. One that fires well, one that um, is on all pistons, if you would, and one that can regulate their emotions very steadily. And the better you can do that, the better you'll have success in our, in our cultures today. But if you get in a funk, um, you're going to be in a job that's asking you to perform at a high mental uh, level that may or may not uh, give you outcomes uh, that you get off these antidepressants and go back to your job. Um, when their function at work gets a little bit depressed, their productivity went down by 50%. When they got to moderate depression, their productivity was 75% of what it should be. And when they got into severe depression, I don't care if they were showing up for work or not. The work they were doing usually was not a forward movement in the process of what they should have done because that we are asking brains to do way more than they've done in any generation. We're asking them to do it longer and then for more year, I mean longer in the days and then more years in life. And so as you look at the consequences for how much you pay in today's society for a, a brain not working as well as it should, uh, it's unbelievably uh, disproportionate. Um, yeah, depression is treatable. Um, symptoms of depression occur due to changes in level of activity in specific parts of the brain. I think that's been the funnest part in my career, um, is that the uh, functional MRI came out in my career. And functional MRI means that I can watch you think. People get really scared when I say that. <laughs> you can watch body language and see what you think, but you can also watch uh, a functional MRI. Um, one of my favorite things to talk about is if we have a patient who's lying under a functional MRI and they're speaking uh, um, their language and I put a smell under their nose and say, patient, what's that smell? And they tell me. Uh, and then you can watch when they're smelling the smell, you can register in, your, in the cortex where you, where you store smell memories. You can see when they figure out that this smell, they're kind of trying to decide is that is that sage, or is that marijuana, or is that orga you know, oregano, what, what is that smell? And so as soon as they have identified the smell, you can see that they found the word because their speech cortex lit up, and you can see that they know the word. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, this is all before anything on the outside of their body moves. But before they speak, if you ask them to tell me that in your second language, let's say they know two languages, we can now see that the the area that they store that second language lights up. They use a different, a distinctly different part of the brain to speak the second language. And you can tell by looking at the functional MRI what age they learned that second language. And if they learned it before the age of 12, it's, it's a much smaller size. The more eight years in age they were when they learned the second language, when they learn a second language, like at 41, <laughs> you're going to need another brain over here to probably speak it as well as if they would have learned it as a child. What I'm showing you is how much technology has improved what we see in a brain. Uh, functional MRIs are the reason we can say, you want to watch what happens during a migraine? We can see that there's actually cell death during migraines. We didn't know this before. We didn't realize that it was causing cell death when these migraines go untreated. Uh, we've gotten a lot more passionate about how do we get these migraines to go away, how do we prevent them from happening, because as you age, ticking off a few cells every time you have a migraine, there's an associated earlier onset of dementia. So these are the kind of cool things we've learned by using the tool of functional MRI. With functional MRI, we've also been able to see that your brain does some goofy things when it has depression. It does very similar things when it has the word anxiety that the words in our society mean different things. Anxiety means something, depression means something. But what your brain is seeing is a very similar, not exact, but very similar. And we know that when you're in the first few stages of depression, there's one problem. But the longer the depression goes on, the more that brain gets sleepy. 
And this is found in several ways that um, we'll show you in a couple slides. Um, looking at TMS, uh, we'll give you a tour of the next room showing what the machine looks like in just a minute. Um, but the, uh, the company that hit the market first with a, um, a magnetic stimulator is uh, Neurostar. And the, or Neuronetics, excuse me. Neurostar is the name of the machine. And Neurostar stimulates the neurons in the area of the brain or the cortex that um, is affected by depression. And again, a, one of the best ways I explain this to patients is that that brain gets sleepy after a while. Um, it doesn't fire as quickly. It's hard to wake up. It's not transmitting that information in a way that we wanted it to. It's asleep. A very similar thing happens with repeated head, head injuries. There is less function. It's, it's harder for those brain uh, messages to get from one place to the, the other due to those repeated injuries. Um, the... Uh, Everybody here has heard of an MRI. So an MRI is a big magnet. It has been another great advancement in our technology that allows us to really hone in how much energy we want put into a place, how much is used, uh, and how deep that energy will penetrate. Uh, MRIs have changed how we look at bodies. Um, they are a fantastic, beautiful picture of us looking inside a body without cutting into a body. Uh, that's one way that we've lear learned to use an MRI. This technology also uses magnetic energy because it is much easier for us to control. It's also easier for us to limit the depth of how deep this goes into the body. Um, and it's, this is in comparison to what would be found in um, like ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, where we send electricity into the brain to cause a seizure uh, and we do, it's called shock therapy from years before where we still use it today. It's actually one of the safest treatments for depression in pregnancy. Um, there is no chemicals involved. The problem with uh, shock therapy is that there is associated memory loss. Part of that is because of the, uh, the energy is not easy to control. It, it does things we don't predict that it will do. And that memory loss is real. Um, it's for that day and for days prior to the treatment, and it has a lot to do with the, uh, our inability to control the electricity once it would get in the brain. With the magnetic energy, it's a much easier uh, science for us to control how deep it penetrated and um, just gives us a lot more uh, flexibility in what we'll do with that energy. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. So when looking at TMS technology, the, the way we've, uh, the studies were set up in our country is that we, uh, it's been looked at for over 20 years, this technology. Again, when I was in training, the, the team that was studying brains there was looking at it for Parkinson's. Um, it does not have FDA approval to treat for Parkinson's, but it does have FDA approval to treat for depression. In that treatment protocol, they um, approved a treatment of five days a week to give this stimulation into the brain and to do this for four to six weeks for about an hour, just under an hour, uh, of using that magnetic energy to wake up the part of the brain that is very treatment resistant or not being awakened with the medications that we use. When a patient comes into me and they have depression and I want to help their brain uh, wake up again, I'm using and changing the chemistry of their brain with these medications. And you will see that adjust and adapt their brain in a couple of ways uh, in hopes that their conduction or the electrical conduction between two parts of the brain gets back to flowing normally. If it has been paused for too long, you'll find that uh, our, first, our first attempt out of the gate for treating depression better be our best one. If we fail when we first treat depression, uh, the chances that the next treatment will work and the next treatment will work become less and less and less likely. By the time we get to the third treatment, the statistical chance that I'm going to be able to fix their depression to the point where they're going to get off the medications and live happily ever after is less than 5%. And this is a population that's been looked at because it costs so much money and takes so much time. By the time you, you don't take an antidepressant for a day or two to get those outcomes, you take an antidepressant for, oh, four to six weeks, and then we'll see how your brain is doing and see how that depression is doing. And if that's not doing right, then we increase the dose a little, or we add another medication. 
And unfortunately, that, uh, that time that's spent waiting for the treatment effect decreases the chances that we'll have a success at getting you totally into remission and then off the medications eventually. Um, yeah, patients sit in a, in a uh, reclined position. Um, they'll hear this clicking sound that if you've watched any of the videos, you'll hear this clicking noise. There's a tapping sensation that's found under the, uh, the um, neurostar um, coil, we call that. Uh, patients are awake during this. This is in comparison to what we do with shock therapy where they're, they're anesthetized or they're sedated. Um, uh, actually, they're sedated and not anesthetized with ECT therapy. And patients return to normal activity immediately after the treatment. That's again, we, we know that as you look at the best way to rehabilitate this, this kind of uh, pocket of nerves that's less than ideally conducting this, the messages, is to gently each day awaken that uh, conduction a little more, a little more, and a little more. And once that's been awakened, it's actually a pretty impressive turning point for patients um, where they say, I don't know that I ever remember feeling this way. It's impressive to me how that's over and over again. You, you look at the testimonies, not just from our practice here, but across the country, that it's an awakening almost that is very rewarding as a physician. And I see it with medicines too, but it's only if we get in that gate early in their treatment pro process, and then they really have a good capture with that first um, medication. Next one. Um, the other uh, important part about um, the world today is that we have more patients on antidepressants than we've ever had before. Uh, when we look back at how these medications like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, they changed how our ability to take care of patients in, with depression, they, they changed the whole field of how psychiatry is done. However, they were not designed to be taken forever. They were designed to be taken to awaken this neuroanatomy, to get that brain back to functioning normal, and then get off of them. Now, studies have been done over and over again that say, geez, once you're on that second antidepressant, the chances you're going to get off of it is really close to zero. And, and that has a lot to do with what we did not understand until this uh, functional MRI data has come about, where we just felt their brain had a, you know, were they born with something that was going to have them depressed? Was the, did the stress ruin part of the brain, like the hippocampus? This was a theory for a while. Uh, we know that there are parts of the brain that got smaller when depression was happening. We would have people who, before we had good meds, before ECT therapy, they would get into a catatonic state. Their body would just shut down. And then eventually they would die. And at autopsy, they would have these really small hippocampi. Hipp hippocampus in the plural is called hippocampi. And that was strange. Like, why is their hippocampus so, so small? As our functional MRIs got more sensitive, we were able to see, geez, people with severe depression that have had this problem for a long time have these very small hippocampi. And so again, connecting us that something was in their brain and maybe they were predestined to get this depression. Um, turns out, no, we don't think, I mean, we think there's a risk of depression and we can argue for a long time of, is it environment? Is it uh, genetics? So I will leave that for a different day. Um, but what we do know is the longer they spend depressed, there's, there's atrophy or loss of cell volume, loss of cellular function in the brain, especially in that really deep part of the brain like the hippocampus. And when we look at how can we impact their depression, these medications are, they are very cost effective. They can do an amazing job of awakening patients, especially if they come in early with this problem. Um, unfortunately, they have side effects. And I can tell you that I think I've seen every one possible after 14 years of writing these prescriptions. It's real. They happen. And you say, what's a better trade, the depression or the side effects? And it's often that discussion that we get back to after time that we, when we can't get that full weight gain for them. So some of them, if, you've any, if any of you have tried an antidepressant, here's some easy ones. The, the sleep cycles are not always reset, so their brain will have insomnia. Um, a dry mouth, blurred vision. Some of them are very fatiguing, uh, nauseating, weight gain. Sexual dysfunction is very common in any of the medications that work with serotonin. Um, and then the GI distress, whether they, their bowels go faster or slower or oscillate between the two functions, both of those tend to be not our best uh, 
not our best selling point when we talk with patients about depression and using those medications. Uh, with TMS, we, we know there is a, um, a discomfort when we, we're sending this energy without any anesthesia through the scalp, through the skull, and into the brain. Um, it is a real sensation. Uh, it's, there is discomfort there. We work very diligently to make sure that we do not cause any undue pain, meaning that energy we want going into the brain, and we don't want a little, pain, uh, a little uh, nerve running under our, our treatment coil that would also send pain into their cheek, or their teeth, or their eye. And this is something that is a very delicate process at first, from the first couple of treatments, because it's such a strange sensation. But most patients, after that third or fourth treatment, really find that there is, there is not a lot of discomfort. Um, they have usually got used to what that sensation is, feels like. And we've also found a place, usually, that the treatment coil can sit without triggering any of the extra nerves. So it's, it's a dance between our treatment approach and the patient's um, acclimation. Uh, so with the studies that were done at, at the, to get federal approval that we can use this to treat depression, um, those statistics showed that one in two showed significant improvement. So this is really important. We get patients who come in and say, Doc, I've been on everything. Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro, Cymbalta, uh, antipsychotics, anti-seizure medications. They've been on lots of them, and they're still severe, moderate to severely depressed. Um, uh, one in two of those patients saw an, a significant improvement. Um, one in three said, I really don't think I feel depressed anymore. That's unbelievable. That is unbelievable in this, in this treatment population. And it, it does make it uh, very impactful when you see patients who have gone from the, the danger zone, that I saw call it, where they've been depressed for so long that the chances that I'm going to be able to make a serious impact is statistically very low. Now, it doesn't stop me from trying, but it's a process that they're frustrated. I'm not usually the first doctor they've come to. Now they've got four or five doctors who try to do several of these things, and our impact is very slight. And when you can do a four- to six-week intervention, where their brain has not awakened uh, to a place where it should have done that the first treatment if we had all of the perfect ways life could be set up. We didn't get that, and now they suffered for those years without being able to have d depression resolved, or the anxiety, whichever their um, label is. It is only FDA approved for depression, but that's where they got their first indication for. Um, there's people that can't have TMS treatment. This is a magnetic coil, and just like uh, magnetic energy can't has to be screened for anybody who's going in for um, a knee, you know, get an imaging for a knee or anything like that. If there's any metal anywhere in their body, the mag the magnet will win. And specifically, if you've got anything in the upper neck, where the treatment coil for or the uh, uh, a stent in one of their carotids or in their brain, and they are actually more common than you'd think. Uh, but those people cannot have a a uh, TMS treatment that will be contraindicated, will do more harm than good in that patient. So one of the most important things that I think is really uh, powerful that I, I, I really want the awareness of TMS to go out to patients is that there is hope for depression. Depression has been uh, something that has been in our society since uh, you can read about it in the Bible. <laughs> you can find it that it is uh, back for generations and thousands of years that depression hits our societies. It is more likely to hit societies that are pushing life too hard, that life is not balanced. But I'd like to welcome anybody to 2013, where our cultures have advanced, where we're asking our brains to do things that we haven't asked them to do in any other generation before us. And we're not asking them to do it for a few years in life, we're asking them to do it for decades. And when they fall out of favor that their brain doesn't do that, it is a significant impact on the quality of their life. We can use medications to help people, but it often doesn't do what we want, which is to reawaken their brain um, like we think it should be, um, like normal brains do. And we have not had that hope, that sustainable hope to give to patients until a technology uh, like TMS arrives at the table where we can not only impact them without medications, but we can get them to a place where they don't need medications um, after the treatment. And that is incredibly inspiring to patients who've been taking medications for multiple years. Um, I, is that the last slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think
think the best part about teaching about TMS is to make sure you get to ask questions. So that's the basic foundation for TMS, um, but challenge me with some questions.